coming up on Outlook. It's a disorder that continues to baffle science, but with greater awareness and dedicated research, more is being learned about autism. Coming up on the show, a conversation about autism, the mystery, the myths, the present, its future, and an area facility that's changing the lives of countless individuals. Later in the half hour, we pay tribute to the planet. Earth Day's coming up. Stay tuned. Outlook is next. Hello and welcome to Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us. You know, it affects one in 68 American children, that according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But since the mid-80s, the incidence of youngsters diagnosed on the autism spectrum has increased almost fourfold. We're going to talk about that as we learn more about autism and about the services available in this region. Welcome with me, if you will, to the program, Michelle Elkins, who is the director of the Cali Autism Program. Thank you for being Thank with you. us. Now, you're a better than 20 year speech pathologist. I am. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Assistant Program Manager with the CAP or Cali Autism Program, Katie Hicks, joins us as well. Thank you yes. for being here, Katie. And Dr. Robert Deidel, who is, you might recognize him as the head of WKU's history department. Today, he wears a different hat. He's sharing a story as a parent of a son who is on the autism spectrum, right? I was gonna say disorder, but we're, we're gonna get into the verbiage and the language. Yeah. So before we get started, we hear so much about autism and this something called autism spectrum and autism spectrum disorder. Give us a working definition for, for this discussion. It is, as we said, it is a spectrum disorder and there are not two children with this diagnosis who are exactly yeah. alike. They are very different. I've often said, if you've spoken to me before, if you've met one child on the autism spectrum, then you've met one child on the autism spectrum because they are all different. They have some common characteristics, but no two are the same. Common characteristics such as communicate, social communication difficulties. All of those will be at different levels, you know, with different children, but also since usually some sensory difficulties are there in almost every child, but at ver again, at varying levels. So it's very difficult. Um, to, you can't just put them in a package and right, say this and is how we're no, going to serve them. Go to the pharmacy and get this, get this it's going to help. Uh -uh. So, whoa. Now, Dr. Dottle, I appreciate your being here to, sh to share your story. Mm -hmm. So, you have a son named Samuel, mm -hmm. and I hope Sam will watch this. Do you call him Sam? Samuel. Okay, oh. Samuel. Okay. So, <laughs> if he's watching, um, tell us a little bit about, first of all, at what point did you begin to suspect that maybe something is not right here? Probably by the time Samuel was two and a half, um, we were noticing that he was very, he had not developed any speech. Um, he seemed active and alert, but um, when he wanted something, uh, his, his tendency was to cry and point rather than to try to, to express that. Um, he did not have much interaction with, he, in fact, he wouldn't interact with children his own age, although he would interact with, with um, his parents, his mother and I. And, um, that's when we started to worry. He was, um, you know, people said, oh, don't worry, boys learn to, uh, it, they yes. learn to speak later. Also, um, my wife who teaches German was speaking German with him a lot, and he, in fact, he can speak some German now. And so there was also evidence that if you're trying to raise a child bilingually, that also delays speech. But there came a point when it just clear that this was not normal. Uh, he was at the WKU child care uh, at the time, daycare, and uh, in January of 20, oh, let's see, 2005, uh, we had Carl Meyer, who is on Western's faculty, come by to um, test him at our house, and I clearly remember that day, because within 15 minutes he said, yes, your son is on the autism spectrum. And that was the beginning of a rather um, unexpected uh, and sometimes difficult journey for us because at that point we didn't know what really that meant. Well, uh, you know, that's a great point because we're hearing so much more about it mm -hmm. in the last decade. So who came up with this and said, okay, this is called autism? Where'd that come from? Probably about <clears throat> 25 years ago or so is when they started to kind of label this based on the characteristics that they were seeing. That physicians were yeah. seeing, and Dr. Dodo, you correct me if you were wrong, 
if I'm wrong, but, and that's when we began the diagnosis. Now, if you and I are thinking about people that we know in, in history, we can go, that's probably uh -huh. what was going on, or, or you may have a physician or somebody that you know that mm -hmm. you go, that's probably what was going on. But at that point, there wasn't a real diagnosis. But I would say 20 to 25 years ago, and then it has steadily picked up. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't believe awareness. it's an epidemic. I'm not saying that, but right. I think our knowledge and our um, awareness has picked up, and I, that could be one of the reasons why the diagnosis has also, the number and diagnosis right, has why also. Right, the numbers have gone up because right. now we're more aware of it. And it, like you say, it's so unique. We're going to talk a little bit more about the spectrum, and we're going to get Katie in here on the discussion on uh, planning and working with children and adults who are on the spectrum. So take us back to Samuel. Okay, so you get this diagnosis, and you say, you remember that day. That's a like life-changing yes. moment when um, you find out. Well, we immediately, my wife uh, and, um, and I immediately began searching for information. Uh, and remember, even 10 years ago, this was not a condition as widely known or publicized. I mean, we, we knew there was such a thing as autism. But some of the information that was readily available was quite disturbing. There was still a tendency to equate uh, autism with mental retardation. Um, and that, of course, was very frightening as well. Uh, and probably the smartest thing I did was um, within a day or two, I went to see David Lee, the dean of Potter College, who's my boss. And I was talking with him. Um, of course, I was, I was very upset. And he said, you know, you need to call Mary Lloyd Moore, who at that point was running the uh, uh, speech therapy, uh, which was in Tate Page Hall on campus. And so I did. And that was a real lifeline because suddenly, I mean, she didn't sugarcoat it. She didn't pretend like, oh, this is all going to go away. Mm -hmm. But suddenly I was talking to someone who had experience, who knew about the condition, who could put me in touch with other individuals who either were parents or with individuals who provided therapy. And then it's at that moment that uh, both of us could sort of exhale because, okay, we we're on, we're on a track. Yeah, we're on a track we're on a where track. we can get some help. And you're not alone. Right. You're not alone. So, you know, we talk about autism, we talk about spectrum, and is it my understanding that this spectrum has changed recently? They, they had different areas. Higher functioning children were referred to as Asperger's. Okay. Which was within that spectrum, we and you had that. early diagnosis being pervasive developmental disorder. Often, that's where they You're began. You're going to be tested on that one. Per right. face, pervasive, pervasive developmental, developmental disorder, disorder. and okay. usually that was your younger children who mm -hmm. you maybe weren't sure, but you thought maybe they were on this end of the spe you know, on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Now they're just referring to it as autism spectrum disorder because that kind of explain it is a spectrum. It's from here to here. It's so, all encompassing. So designating different areas just didn't seem to be productive anymore. We just say it is autism spectrum or ASD and mm -hmm. kind of drop it. Now you will still hear Asperger's. You will still hear pervasive mm -hmm. developmental delay because that's what people are used to saying. But at this point it is considered one one area of autism spectrum. And it happens at a young age or can someone be 20 and suddenly they develop? A form of autism. I'm going to let you, I'm going to yes. let Katie on because um, I'm intrigued by that. Yes, yeah. I work primarily with the college program um, with CAP, so we call it uh, the Kelly Autism Program Circle of Support, and it supports college students on Western's campus who probably previously had a diagnosis of Asperger's, and now it's just under the autism umbrella. I have some college students who always knew that maybe something wasn't quite right. Their family always knew that maybe something qu wasn't quite right, um, but they might not have received a diagnosis until they were 18 or 20. Wow. And, um, um, so a lot of my students feel very relieved when they find out that diagnosis. There's like there's an explanation for what I've always felt known. Socially awkward. Yes, or, they felt mm -hmm. you know, di just different things that they maybe even mm -hmm. we might have seen them as. I hate, I'm using the word quirky. Right. Maybe and just a little just something, unique. and they knew yes. that I'm unique. I'm different, but I don't know why, and they are relieved. So yes. you may be diagnosed at two. We have those who are diagnosed mm -hmm. at 18, 19, 20 when they realize. There is something mm -hmm. a little different. Well, and again, the you are not alone, which mm -hmm. is which has got to be huge. We're going to talk a little bit more about the services available through the Cali Autism Program and learn more about autism when Outlook continues. We're going to take a short break. Don't go away.
Outlook continues. We're glad you stayed with us. We're having a discussion today about autism as the month of April is dedicated as Autism Awareness Month. We are joined back on this second segment by Michelle Elkins, who is the director of the Kelly Autism Program. Assistant Program Manager Katie Hicks joins us and Dr. Robert Deidel, whose son Samuel was diagnosed on the spectrum, the autism spectrum. So uh, we talk a lot about understanding autism. I don't guess we'll ever really mm -hmm. understand autism or what causes it. Do we have any further evidence of what? Reading over the evidence, the um, research, even just today, mm -hmm. I, I found something that I was really found interesting and was reading it. And we may never know a true one, this is the cause, but we do know that there is a genetic link. And okay. also now they are saying probably a, an environmental link. And the two of those together, when there is a genetic component, maybe if there's any Environmental, kind of environmental influence, then it makes you a little bit more susceptible. I guess. Well, to and that. it could be the perfect storm, right? Who right. knows yeah. that these two things. But have we to don't come know together. what that environmental link is. You know, it's uh -huh. just something possibly in our environment, mm -hmm. whether it be something we're eating, something we're ingesting, something that's in our atmosphere. Those kind of things can make us more susceptible. You know, you mentioned when you got the diagnosis on your son Samuel that you know at that point in time, because he's going to be 15 in August you were talking about, you know, there was a lot of correlation to mental illness and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we have a genetic link, uh, physiological, for a long time people thought it was something neurological. Right. And it still is considered a neurological disorder. Disorder. It, okay. it is. And, and that affects these, in these particular um, characteristics in, uh, in them. So let's talk briefly. Um, if you know anything about autism, when we talk about the spectrum, there are those and if you've watched the show on a regular basis, I had the pleasure of interviewing Temple Grandin twice and um, she is a unique individual and has done a lot for furthering understanding of um, autism. But you know, it can be social awkwardness. It can be, you know, minuscule in that mm -hmm. regard. It can be nonverbal. Mm -hmm. It can be the sense of touch can't be touched. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, it runs the gamut. Sound. Sound. Visual. Certain you know, sound. lots of. Okay. Also, executive functions. Right. Of organization Vision. skills. Issues. Planning. Oh. Problem solving. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. Those are considered on the. Okay. And that's a lot of what Katie deals with yes. in the college program the executive mm -hmm. functioning skills, the organization, Katie. Which yes. are extremely critical when you're in college and want to pass a class, right? Exactly. Most of my college students, um, when most people think of autism, they don't think of what my college students actually kind of present like. They're. Um, social communication is difficult for them. They can definitely communicate. They're very verbal, very high IQs, very high ACT scores, very capable of going to college. But um, just socialization is very hard for them, knowing what to do socially. Reading social cues is difficult. But then they also have difficulty planning, maybe organizing, like we mentioned, time management, um, things like that. All these things that happen in the frontal lobe of your brain can sometimes be very difficult for my college students. So we do have some high functioning, you know, at, at that uh, end of the spectrum, almost savant in some cases, just so focused on some things, huh? Focused and, and especially interested. And when it's something they are especially interested in, what they can almost over focus on it. However, it can also lead to very gifted areas. Mm -hmm. And I think we see that a lot with yes. some of our college students. We see very gifted areas. We have, um, I'm thinking of one in particular that I know will be a, an engineer. Yes. Very focused. Who and has the focus for engineering, and the but maybe not right, other skills. Right. And the wonderful mm -hmm. thing about him is he's gone from being a student in our program and continues to be a student in our program to now a mentor for uh, others. So we've been others. able, you know, he's kind of a success story, I think, yes. for us. I'm seeing a theme here. You're not alone. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about Samuel now. As we mentioned, you know, he's a teenager, and I'm sure, you know, when they're younger, being a parent is tough in mm -hmm. general. And right. then you have all these other challenges before you puberty right now is causing a bit of an issue. Yes, um, about two years ago I attended a presentation by someone, an uh, autism expert from the University of Louisville at Life Skills, and they said, get ready, it's gonna be tough. I had no idea. <laughs> um, you know, in, if, even with children without development delays, puberty presents some pretty sure, serious okay. challenges, but uh, with individuals on the autism spectrum, it's, uh, it's much more intense in that, um, they don't know how to navigate uh, the social world as well. Um, there are these changes to their body. Uh, there, there are certain activities. Well, I mean, self-stimulation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most kids do it, but most know when you should and when you shouldn't. And those are all things that, um, as a parent, you have to be much more proactive about um, 
We notice changes in Samuel's behavior. Um, and of course, the, the challenge is what, what part of it is autism and what part of it is just he's a bratty teenager, right? I mean, it's <laughs> not always, uh, it's not always clear. Um, and we've had many more meetings with uh, the local school than we had in the past, but things have now started to calm down. We've gotten over that first hurdle. And I would say the school district's been very helpful as well. Um, so I think, I think this too will we'll get through it on this to the next stage. <laughs> well, you know, we talk, and, and that's a great example of the, you know, we fear what we don't understand. And um, there's a lot of social stigma attached to someone with autism. You know, as you said, you know, just coming up when 10, 15 years ago, how, mm -hmm. you know, people Different reacted. Right. Yes. How does one counter that? We have done a lot of presentations on campus um, to advocate for our college students and to let professors and faculty know um, about our college students and the struggles that they have. We also train RAs here on campus. So I feel like probably, resident assistants. yes, RAs. residents mm -hmm. assistants on campus in the dorms because our college students are in the dorms just like every other college student would be. Um, and I feel like that's probably the first step to really combating that stigma is awareness. But we're also almost moving from awareness into more of an acceptance kind of movement because everybody is very, not everybody, but we're becoming more aware as a society of what autism is, but people maybe have a different view. They don't see the whole spectrum. And I feel like seeing the whole spectrum um, and discussing that openly, maybe understanding what our students go through is um, integral. Will lead to that yes, acceptance. will lead you to know, that acceptance. So, so you don't anticipate that there will ever be a cure for this thing called autism. So in the interim, it's essential that to help people just navigate it, it, you know, it's important to intervene, if you will. The Kelly Autism Program has been an invaluable tool to a lot of people. It's located here on the WK campus, but I get a little confused. So there's the Suzanne Vitelli Clinical Education Complex, <laughs> there's the Kelly Autism Program. Help us understand. All in the same building. Okay. The Suzanne Vitelli Clinical Education Complex is a building here on campus where we do try to serve children basically almost from birth through adulthood. In, in some capacity. So for our younger guys, we have our um, early childhood center, also known as Big Red School, which Samuel also yeah. uh, attended there when he was younger. So that works with our children from age three to about five to six when they're beginning first grade. And then within that same building, we have the Kelly Autism Program, which starts at age seven, right at first grade. And we go through the end of high school and through adult. I have two groups that even through adulthood, a life skills group where we're working on essential life skills. They are a little bit lower functioning and then I have an employability group where we're working on them getting jobs. Actually, and then under jobs. that same umbrella as Kelly was, as Katie was saying, we have the the circle of support for our college age students. Our so college. all and then the communication disorders clinic also housed under there. So we hope to be able to serve our serve these children and others, you know, who are on the just sure. have developmental delays or, or speech delays all underneath this same building. Well, and I know it's been a model for other programs across the country. Uh, we're quickly running out of time. So we've got um, and, and a better understanding, I hope, of autism. But let, let's give you a, a word in here as far as it stands. You know, she's talking about adults who, you know, mm -hmm. go on. Do you ever see a time when Samuel will be self-sufficient or? Um. Of course, our, our hope is that he someday could lead a semi-independent life. Um, it's, um, Samuel's probably not going to go to college, um, but if he, and if he does live on his own, it would have to be with a very strong support system in place. Uh, and what I've noticed is as, the, as awareness of autism increases and a sort of this sort of increase of individuals with the diagnosis moves through into new age groups, um, services are beginning to expand as well into adulthood. You know, any, um, any parent with uh, a child with autism, I, what, what haunts me is, have you ever seen in the paper those little notices saying, would the relatives of so-and-so please contact the authorities because somebody's died alone, mm -hmm. no family. Um, you know, that's, that's the fate you fear the most. Um, but on the other hand, I do see developments, I do see interests, and I think that sort of fate can be avoided. I like that. And as far as the, the growing awareness and the services and the opportunities that are available, you're very optimistic as well. I am. And, and as he said, as the diagnosis has become more numerous, as we 
we have to expand. We have to expand through adulthood because they are still going to continue to need our services and our help all the way through adulthood to hopefully be able to live as independently as each individual person can. And through that, we're hoping for person-centered. Look at that person, what do they need? And individualize it. Consider the source, my mama always said. We'll, <laughs> we'll give you the last word, Katie. I think expanding um, college support programs for individuals with autism is incredibly important as well. There's a very high demand for it. As they get older, there are individuals who are college bound and who can definitely earn a college degree on the autism spectrum. So yes, and so we hope to expand that as well. We'll leave it on that optimistic note. Thanks so much and thank you for sharing your story. Right. And uh, when we come back, we're gonna find out about paying tribute to the planet. Earth Day's around the corner, stay with us. Outlook continues. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you stayed with us. One of our favorite guests is joining us right now, Christian Ryan, who is WKU Sustainability Coordinator. How are you? I'm so good. You're Thank upset, you. though, about idling cars, oh. I understand. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Um, just before we started, I was telling you the story about my morning run and how, um, you know, I see cars idling in driveways and, and um, you know, that there's certainly some sort of correlation between that and increase in childhood asthma and so yes it's just one of my I have a few sustainability pet peeves and that's <laughs> one of them. <laughs> well add that one to your list. Well you know what's interesting if you joined us for the beginning of the program we were talking about autism mm -hmm. and how they're finding uh, an environmental link and it would be difficult to pinpoint what that is but you know we can't we can't look away anymore pay attention, right? Right, exactly. And then that, and you know, hearing about that, the environmental link is what sort of led me to childhood asthma and the idling cars. And yes, it's, we're, you know, all of these things are connected. And, and of course, sustainability is, uh, or at least my work in sustainability is all about helping people make those connections that we just aren't necessarily thinking of. Right, and it's nothing, nothing bad or wrong, but we just need to be made aware. Maybe we're just clueless in that regard. You talked about a no idling policy at some schools, which I think is interesting. When you think about, and many of us moms have been there, in the car line waiting to pick up the youngins, and what's happening? We're in the school play yard waiting to pick them up, and the car's idling. And the car's idling, and the buses are also idling. And um, yes, there's wonderful stories about actually school children, um, students that have worked to implement no idle policies at their schools. And um, you know, I love the stories where it's young people that are that are coming up with these ideas and making these connections and making change. It's um, really inspiring, and there's lots of those in in, in the world of K-12. You know, uh, w this is interesting. I didn't realize there was such a big correlation to what we talked about in the earlier segments, but kind of the social stigma when one is diagnosed with autism, there was for years a social stigma with those who cared about the environment. <laughs> they called them ugly things like <laughs> tree huggers and, you know, but I think as people are learning more that it's for real, they're becoming more involved. Do you agree? I. I agree. I certainly hope so. I'm aware that I sort of live in this wonderful sustainability sort of bubble, maybe if you will, here at WKU, where the students that I'm that I work with every single day and that I'm surrounded by, they they truly get it and they truly care and they're working to make a better world. And so I hope that what I'm observing at WKU goes far beyond the campus community, and I I'm, I know that it does. That's encouraging. We're, you're watching this, we're talking about Earth Day is coming up, WKU is going to celebrate its 10th Earth Day celebration, but I'm curious, if you're watching this and you think, nah, my, I can't make a difference, what would you say to someone who has that kind of defeatist attitude as it relates to the environment? Oh my gosh. Um, so, well, certainly every single one of us can make a difference. And, and I feel that it, it is, it can be really overwhelming. You know, I mean, when I start talking to people about, um, you know, all, all of the various things that I see that could be better, you know, mm -hmm. could be, could mm -hmm. be improved, um, they start, you know, they easily get overwhelmed and, oh my gosh, I'm just afraid I'm going to make the right, wrong choice, you know, paper or plastic or, you know, so right. forth and so on. And that's socially <laughs> unacceptable. What will people exactly. say? Yes. And so, um, so yeah, it can be it can be overwhelming, but absolutely the actions of, of one person can make a difference. And what it makes me think about is is our current elections. And I just saw a graphic, and of course it was on Facebook, so you know I can't credit or even know if, if how accurate it is. 
but this this graphic suggests that you know two or three fourths of the population are not voting, and so I think what ha what's happening is here is people are thinking my vote doesn't make a difference, and it's the exact same thing with you know environmental actions. Oh, my actions won't make a difference, but. <laughs> yes, it but, will. Yes, yes exactly. It will. You know what they say, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. You're part of the problem. Well, how, how are you going to celebrate a decade of sustainability on the WPA? Oh, my goodness. I can't believe it's the 10th annual Earth Day Festival. And what's real, what I love to think about is that it was a student organization, Green Toppers, that, that um, hosted sure. the very first Earth Day Festival. Um, and this year, it's actually the Student Government Association um, Sustainability Committee. Um, they're, they're hosting the Earth Day Festival, and we have so many fun things planned. The number one thing that we want to do on Earth Day is get folks out to share their sustainability stories, right? So we want to know what everybody's doing to be more environmentally and socially friendly. And so we'll have um, different student organizations talking about their various projects, and. We will have uh, folks from the community, our partners in the community that are doing good things for the planet. And we're just gonna celebrate all this good, good work that's going on with food and music and art and, and education. And it's just gonna be a really good time. Sounds like a good, and we're gonna put up uh, an information at the end where you can find out more. So leave us with some words of wisdom. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> words of wisdom. Um, if you need to, you know, if you need to feel inspired, uh, just take a short walk outside. Now is the time when the earth is, is, is giving us its full glory. I mean, this is my favorite time of year and just taking a walk out into the backyard. You know, we have a garden at the Office of Sustainability, a community garden, and just looking at everything that's coming up and blooming and, um, you know, it's all so lovely. How could you not, um, just soak that in and have an appreciate, appreciation for the planet and, and, ha and feel that connectedness and, and want to do the right thing. Thank you so much. We've been talking with WKU Sustainability Coordinator, who's just a little bit passionate about the planet. <laughs> That's going to wrap it up, Christian Ryan. Thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us. See you next time.